the news now on BBC One with Hugh Edwards. Still hope for peace with Iraq, says President Bush in a New Year message. But he also warns the American economy could be crippled by an Iraqi attack. Dozens of flood warnings across England and Wales, with more rain to come. And all set in Edinburgh tonight as the crowds begin to gather to welcome 2003. Good evening. There's still hope that Iraq will disarm peacefully and avoid a war, according to President Bush, who's been speaking tonight. But he went on to warn that an attack on America by Iraq or by a group sponsored by Saddam Hussein could cripple the U.S. economy. Mr. Bush admitted that the state of Iraq's weapons program was still uncertain. From Washington, here's Tom Carver. George Bush today indulged in one of his favorite pastimes, a cheeseburger and a chat with the locals. Happy New Year to everybody. Walking over to reporters, he revealed his New Year's resolution for Iraq. I hope this Iraq situation will be resolved peacefully. One of my New Year's resolutions is to work to uh, deal with these situations in a, in a way so that they're resolved peacefully. Uh, but uh, thus far, it appears that uh, on first look that Saddam Hussein hadn't heard the message. He was asked how he could justify a costly war with the American economy in recession. Uh, an attack from Saddam Hussein or a surrogate of Saddam Hussein would cripple our economy. Uh, my biggest job and most important job is to protect the security of the American people and I'm going to do that. In Iraq today, no holiday let up for the inspectors. By the time the new year arrives, they'll have visited nearly 100 sites with no obvious sign of any chemical or biological weapons. Desperate to avert military action, the Iraqis are bending over backwards to be helpful. Today, they invited the head of the inspection's team, Hans Blix, to come to Baghdad for talks. The UN Secretary General Kofi Annan says that given this Iraqi cooperation, there's no need for military action before the inspectors deliver their report in a month's time. And most Americans would agree with that. This isn't a country thirsting for a war. Bush's comments might seem far-fetched, but they do reveal something about what keeps him awake at night. The fear that the next attack on America might include chemical or biological weapons, courtesy of Saddam. Tom Carver, BBC News, Washington. Back home and dozens of flood warnings are in place across England and Wales tonight after days of heavy rainfall and a warning from experts that there's more rain and maybe snow on the way. Tonight, the Environment Agency said the number of areas at risk was likely to rise. Three main areas have been affected. In East Anglia, there are 19 flood warnings currently in place. In the Midlands, which has the highest share of flood warnings, the rivers Avon and Severn head the list. Caravan parks and farmland have been badly affected, and there's worse to come. In the East Midlands, transport has been badly affected there. Many roads have been closed. Others are gradually becoming impassable as further outbreaks of heavy rain are expected overnight. In the southeast of England, Kent has suffered the most. From there, Robert Hall sent us this report. As the old year ends, fresh problems sweep through these Kent valleys. Roads and property underwater, homes once more at risk. East Peckham, with communities across the region, saw more than half an inch of rain in just a few hours, falling on land that was already saturated. There are painful memories here of the damage wreaked by the 2000 floods, this time, changes to insurance guidelines may limit payouts, but the industry says it will do all it can to help. The number of properties um, where people are going to find it extremely hard to get insurance of any kind is going to be very, very limited. There is an air of resignation in these flood-prone communities. Whilst confident that they may have escaped serious damage this time round, no one here is in any doubt that over the next two to three days, their preparations and their patience will again be tested to the limit. In Kent this evening, the emphasis is on practical advice, although even the experts can do little but watch the skies. Even if there is rain tomorrow, it could take 24 hours to reach the rivers. Sandbags may offer little defence, but experience has at least taught these villages what to expect. So far, the threat's held off. But for how much longer? Robert Hall, BBC News, Kent.
there's little prospect of compensation for England's cricket authorities if they pull out of their World Cup match in Zimbabwe in February. The government insists the final decision on whether to play is one for the officials. There'll be further talks next week. The England team in Australia have not only been training for the Ashes, but also for the World Cup, which begins in just over a month's time. The government wants them to pull out of the opening match because it's being held in Zimbabwe. The new chairman of the England Cricket Board, who takes office tomorrow, says that could cost the sport dear. If England were prevented for some reason from fulfilling their commitments in the World Cup, then the ramifications would be significant. Financial penalties would be significant and we'd be seeking compensation. The government says because it's the board's decision whether to play, the taxpayer shouldn't have to foot the bill. This is the decision uh, of the ECB, the England and Wales Cricket Board. It's not a decision for the government and therefore I do not think that uh, the taxpayer should be compensating them. If England's cricketers don't play, the cricket board faces a bill of up to a million pounds. That cash is made up of lost ticket sales, the loss of TV rights and of sponsorship. If Zimbabwe retaliates by pulling out of next summer's tour here, the figure could reach up to 10 million. No one is suggesting the home of English cricket here at Lords will have to sell off the family silver, but cricket officials will tell the government next week that without financial help, they simply can't afford not to play. To prevent President Mugabe making political capital out of the Cricket World Cup, ministers may yet be persuaded that compensation is a price worth paying. Sean Lay, BBC News. Police in London investigating the death of a woman and a teenage girl have discovered more body parts in bin bags in a street in North London. Officers have sealed off the area. They believe both the victims were killed over the Christmas period. Among those honoured in the New Year's list is a 93-year-old man who saved hundreds of Jewish children from the Nazis. Nicholas Winton, now Sir Nicholas, was one of a thousand people recognised in the latest honours, as George Eakin reports. St Andrew's Church in Soham became the focus for grief at the deaths last summer of the schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. The vicar is honoured. I'll be thinking about the people of Soham. Um, on whose behalf I'm receiving it. But I'll also be thinking about the clergy up and down the country who do exactly the same as me, but without the media spotlight. The parents of the murdered teenager Stephen Lawrence both receive OBEs. Doreen and Neville Lawrence have spent the nine years since his death campaigning against racism. I've always loathed that Dudale boy. For a career spanning six decades, the veteran actor Alan Bates is knighted. So is Ridley Scott, director of the movie Gladiator. Few sporting sensations will beat this moment at the Belfry in September. Yeah! Europe, the underdogs, had beaten the Americans for the Ryder Cup. Team captain Sam Torrance gets the OBE. And Commonwealth triple jump champion Asher Hansen gets an MBE. Behind the knighthood given to Nicholas Winton lies an extraordinary story kept secret for generations. Just before the Second World War, he smuggled almost 700 children out of Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia. On television in the 80s, some of those children finally met their rescuer. Uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. <laughs> the man dubbed the British Schindler said simply, I just did what I could to help. George Eakin, BBC News. In just under three hours, we'll be turning our backs on 2002 and greeting the new year. Millions of people across the world have, of course, already entered 2003. Celebrating has been colourful and uh, very enthusiastic. As ever, the people of Sydney, Australia, showed us all how to do it in style with a brilliant fireworks display against the backdrop of the city's wonderful harbour and bridge. And uh, catching up with Sydney was Beijing, the countdown in China's capital, was watched by many thousands as they welcomed the new year with plenty of ticker tape and Chinese fireworks. And have a look at this, a bit of a contrast. Here's the scene tonight in the heart of London where the celebrations will be, well, rather more low-key. Police are urging the crowds to avoid Trafalgar Square, the usual focus for festivities in London because of major building work. But... Edinburgh is expecting 100,000 people to celebrate Hogmanay tonight in a huge street party despite the freezing temperatures. Our man John Morrison is there. 
The centre of Edinburgh is now sealed off. More than a thousand police officers and security guards are checking tickets and patrolling the streets. Could you please have any bags ready for inspection at the gate? Earlier this month, eight Algerians were arrested in Edinburgh, sparking fears partygoers could be targeted by terrorists. The police are in a heightened state of alert, but they're playing down the threat. Globally, there's a higher threat level, and I think people are naturally very wary about um, the situation throughout the world and terrorist attack. But um, there has never been um, a specific threat against Edinburgh's Hogmanay or Hogmanay celebrations anywhere to my knowledge. World events may be overshadowing the celebrations, but it's not holding back the tens of thousands of tourists who've come to the home of Hogmanay to bring in the new year. In its 10th year, it seems Edinburgh's street party is now world famous. Yeah, I think we should, some people in China even you know, heard about it, I think, yeah. So it's quite famous, actually, yeah. So yeah, I heard about it at home. It's one of the things you've got to do when you come over here, so... This and the beer fest, they're like uh, Kiwi, Aussie and stuff I think they do. As the countdown to midnight continues, it seems the biggest street party in the world is going to live up to its reputation. Well, there's now about three hours to go and the action is really heating up here. Fantastic atmosphere on the street. The main focus will be this stage behind me. The main highlight, uh, highlight will be Miss Dynamite. Now, some of the crowd will be in here in the gardens, but tens of thousands of others will be outside in Princess Street. They'll be able to watch the action on giant screens which have been erected at either end of the street. And then at midnight, the music stops and 10 tons of fireworks will be released, lighting up the night sky. It promises to be some party. Hugh. John, enjoy Miss Dynamite. Thank you very much for that. That's it. There'll be coverage of the New Year's Eve celebrations in Edinburgh and elsewhere in the UK on BBC News 24 through the night. But from all of us here, have a very happy and very healthy New Year. Take care. the world be like in the year 2020? Let BBC I know at bbc.co.uk slash future and you could get your thoughts published in print in the book of the future. Good evening. We've already had a lot of wet weather, still numerous flood warnings out across England and Wales and unfortunately the Met Office a warning of more very wet weather tomorrow, particularly in areas where the ground is saturated and we have a lot of flood warnings right now. It's already starting to show that rain on our radar picture and it will creep northwards through the night. It's likely to turn to snow for a time from the Peak District northwards, several hours of snow over the hills here, even at lower levels for a short time and this is the rain we're watching to come in for tomorrow. It's a cold night ahead of that rain, hence the risk of some snow, some icy patches as well. Pretty nasty if you're caught on the higher level routes across northern England and Scotland with that snow reducing the visibility. And it'll continue into the morning as well, into New Year's morning. For most of us, a pretty miserable day for the start of 2003. A lot of heavy rain around through Northern Ireland, England and Wales. Eventually that milder air creeps northwards, so the snow risk becomes confined to the highlands through the afternoon in the Grampians. And it may start to brighten up and dry up a little in the southwest, but for most of us, a bit of a washout. And although mild in southern and western areas than today, still cold in the north and the east. Now, we say goodbye to that particular area of low pressure during Thursday, but another one rattles straight in behind, so a renewed risk of more heavy rain in the south. Gales or severe gale force winds too, and a renewed risk of flooding. And as the air gets colder in the north, it looks like the rain will turn progressively to snow, even at lower levels across parts of Scotland. And then by the weekend, there's a risk of some snow even in the south. Have a good new year. Bye-bye. Dale Winton, Louis Theroux and Alan Titchmarsh see in the new year with Jonathan Ross at 11.30. First on BBC One, you're invited to one of the best parties of the year. The sensational, the unforgettable party at the Palace. <laughs>